<laughs> well, welcome, Napani. It is so nice to be here, and I hope everybody is surviving COVID. I know it's been a tough couple of years, and I haven't been out there as much as I'd like to, but believe me, this year, we hope to change all that. I want to sit down and read a couple of stories for the kids out there, and I hope they're all being good. So I'm going to get started. We've got a beautiful book here, it's called The Nutcracker, and I'm going to start reading the book. Once upon a time in Nuremberg, Germany, snowflakes fell softly on Christmas Eve, turning the whole city into a sparkling wonderland. In those days, people had parties and gave gifts the night before Christmas instead of Christmas morning. All of the children tried to be on their best behavior, even though they were very excited. They couldn't wait for their grandparents and aunts and uncles and friends to arrive so they could open their presents. That's just like you guys out there, but you can't wait till Christmas. Clara and her older brother Fritz waited for their guests in the parlor near the Christmas tree. They thought it was the most magnificent tree in the whole wide world. It reached almost to the ceiling, and every branch held a beautiful ornament that sparkled in the candlelight. A lovely angel with a gossamer wings smiled down at them from the tip top, and toys and packages tied with colorful bows peeked out from underneath the bottom of the branches. The, the children impatiently waited, watched their mother and father greet the people, people who came to their house. They wished everyone would hurry up and take off their hats and coats so the party could start. They were getting pretty excited about this party, probably especially about the presents. Clara and Fritz were delighted when Clara's godfather, Dr. Drosmeyer, arrived with an armful of presents. They knew his gifts would be the best of all because he was no ordinary doctor. He was an inventor. He created marvelous toys that would move and speak. That Christmas Eve, the doctor gave Fritz a lively jack-in-the-box and an army of splendid wooden soldiers. He gave Clara two wind-up dancing dolls miniature castle surrounded by a moat and beautiful gardens, and an elegantly carved doll-sized boat. The children thanked the doctor for the wonderful gifts and showed them to everyone at the party. But the doctor had one more gift to give that night. Reaching deep inside the red lining of his purple cloak, he pulled out a long box tied with pink satin ribbon and placed it gently in Clara's arms. Somehow Clara knew this was a very special gift, something her godfather had made just for her. She carefully untied the bow and opened the box. Inside she found a handsome wooden soldier in full dress uniform. Clara thought to herself that the soldier's head was far too big for the body and she wondered about his large jaws until Fritz explained, It's a nutcracker. Clara pulled, put a small nut in the soldier's mouth, and pressed the lever at the back of his head, and the soldier easily cracked the nut and chopped it into Clara's hand. I want it, yelled Fritz yanking the nutcracker out of Clara's hand. He quickly stuffed several large nuts into the soldier's mouth and pressed down hard on the lever. With a painful crack, the soldier's jaws broke, and three of his perfectly formed teeth fell out. Oh no, cried Clara, reaching for the broken soldier and cradling him in her arms. The soldier's bright blue eyes seemed to look deep into hers and Clara snuggled him tighter. The doctor stooped over, picked up the soldier's broken teeth, and tucked them into one of the small pockets of his gold vest. 
Then he knelt down next to Clara and helped her wrap a handkerchief around the nutcracker's head to hold his broken jaws together. Clara gently kissed the wounded, wounded, wounded soldier on the cheek, being careful not to dis disturb the bandage. She whispered that she loved him and would not let anyone hurt him ever again. By the time it was almost midnight, and the doctor and the other guests wished Fritz, Clara, and their parents a Merry Christmas and went home. Clara's mother helped her put on her nightgown, tucked her into bed, and kissed her goodnight. As soon as her mo mother left the bedroom, Clara climbed out of bed and slipped quietly into the parlor. She wanted to make sure her nutcracker was safe for the night. She gently tucked the wounded soldier into a doll-sized bed in the glass cabinet where she and Fritz kept wonderful toys. She gave her beloved nutcracker another soft kiss on the cheek before she closed the cabin door. So she tucked the soldier right into a little cabinet where they, they kept all the rest of the toys that the doctor had given them. Clara suddenly felt so tired that she lay down on the sofa next to the cabinet and promptly fell asleep. A strange scratching sound woke her up, and when Clara opened her eyes, she let out a scream. Hundreds of mice were skittering across the room. Their leader, a mouse as big as Clara, was urging them towards the glass cabinet to attack the wooden soldiers. Clara's wounded nutcracker, riding a spirited horse Dr. Drosmeyer had made, was leading the soldiers in the battle against the mice. My goodness, I don't know if this is a dream or if it's real. Clara started cheering on her beloved nutcracker and the wooden soldiers. They fought valiantly but the mice outnumbered them. As Clara watched her brave nutcracker, courage courageously raised his sword, ready to attack the mouse king. Seeing the danger her wounded soldier faced, Clara sprang into action. She pulled off her right slipper and threw it at the mouse king, shouting, leave my nutcracker alone. Clara's slipper hit the mouse king and knocked off his crown. Poof, the king and all his mice vanished. Clara couldn't believe her eyes when the nutcracker's wounds healed instantly and he turned into a handsome prince. My, de my dear Clara, he said, you have saved my life. The prince picked up the mouse king's crown and offered it to Clara. Please let me put this crown on your head and take you to my kingdom, the land of the Sugar Plum Fairy. Oh yes, said Clara, I'd like to see your kingdom. Taking Clara's hand, the prince led her to a pink lemonade, lemonade stream that had appeared out of nowhere and helped her into a beautifully carved boat. As the prince guided the boat downstream, he told Clara about the spell a witch had passed on when he was a little boy. The witch turned him into a nutcracker and told him that the only way he could become a prince again was to win a battle and have a beautiful lady fall in love with him. Thank you, Clara, for loving me and helping me defeat the mouse king and his mice, said the prince. You are most welcome, replied Clara, smiling happily. As they rounded a bend in the stream, a beautiful castle came into view. That's my home. The Sugar Plum Fairy will be waiting to greet us, the prince told her. Clara clapped her hands in delight when their boat reached the stairs leading up from the moat to the castle. Gumdrops and meringue squirrels lined the scared staircase that led through the garden of bright, colorful flowers and groves of red licorice, shrubs, and peppermint stick trees. Just as the prince had told her, the 
Sugar Plum Fairy was waiting for them. She stood with her arms open and ready to hug them. Clara thought she was the most beautiful lady she had ever seen. The Sugar Plum Fairy led them to the ballroom where people from all over the kingdom had gathered for a grand party to celebrate the prince's homecoming and to honor Clara. Clara and the prince sat together on a golden throne and munched on delicious cookies and candies while his loyal subjects entertained them with music and dancing. Some of the dancers twirled so fast that their feet hardly seemed to touch the floor and some of them leaped so high that they seemed to touch the ceiling. Clara turned to the prince and said, I wish I could dance like that. Before the words were out of her mouth, Clara found herself in the midst of the dancers. She seemed to be dancing on air as she twirled faster and faster and leaped higher and higher. The prince joined her and they danced until dawn. The prince helped Clara back into the beautifully carved boat and took her home. Thank you for a wonderful time, Clara told him, and they learned, leaned over and kissed her hand. She kept waving goodbye until his boat disappeared around the bend in the stream. Then she climbed into her bed, snuggled down under the blankets, and fell sound asleep. A man's voice saying, Merry Christmas, wake, woke her up. Then she heard her mother reply, Merry Christmas, Dr. Grossmeyer. Clara sat up in bed. Her godfather had arrived to eat Christmas breakfast with them. She couldn't wait to tell them about the Mouse King and the battle and her wounded nutcracker turning into a handsome prince and the wonderful party in the land of the Sugar Plum Fairy. She wanted to thank him again for his very special gift, the splendid nutcracker he had made just for her. And that is the end of the nutcracker story. I hope you enjoyed that. That's a lovely story. I think we're going to go on to another one now. I hope everybody's okay. Well, we, what we have here is the Charlie Brown Christmas. Now let's see what the Charlie Brown Christmas is all about. I love reading stories. I think everybody knows Charlie Brown. That's the Peanuts character. It's the most magical time of year. Christmas is coming. The air is crisp and cold. Children are ice skating. And the sound of Christmas carols fills the air. Everyone is in holiday spirit. Well, almost everyone. Uh-oh. Somebody's not in holiday spirit. I think there must be something wrong with me, Charlie Brown says. Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. I like getting presents sending cards, decorating trees, and all that. But I always end up feeling sad. Charlie Brown, you're the only person I know who can take a wonderful season like Christmas and turn it into a problem, Linus says. Maybe Lucy's right. All of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Browniest. <laughs> Charlie Brown decides to talk to Lucy gives really good advice, and it only costs five cents. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but there's Lucy. And she's got her own little uh, box there, that, and Charlie Brown's in front of her, and he's going to start talking to her. Now, let's see what he says. I just don't understand Christmas, Charlie Brown tells her. Instead of feeling happy, I sort of feel let down. You need to get involved in the real Christmas project, Lucy advises. How would you like to be the director of our Christmas play? Me, a director? Charlie Brown is surprised at this suggestion. He knows nothing about directing, but it sounds exciting. He agrees to meet Lucy at the school auditorium. On his way to the auditorium, Charlie Brown spots his dog Snoopy, carrying a box of Christmas ornaments and lights. He watches as Snoopy carefully decorates his dog house. Snoopy has entered a contest to win money for the best neighborhood Christmas lights and display. My own dog has
has gone commercial, Charlie Brown groans. I can't stand it. And there's a picture of Snoopy with his doghouse all decorated. Ho, 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 ho. Oh, that's Snoopy. Next, Charlie Brown is stopped by his sister Sally. Will you help me write a letter to Santa Claus, Big Brother? Sally asks. Charlie Brown begins to write down everything Sally says. Dear Santa Claus, Sally starts, How have you been? I have been extra good this year, so I have a long list of presents. But you can make it easy on yourself. Just send money. How about tens and twenties? Ho, 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 ho. Charlie Brown sighs. Good grief, he says. Well, my goodness. Sally wants tens and twenties instead of Christmas presents. When Charlie Brown finally arrives at the auditorium, the cast is waiting for him. Okay, let's have quiet, he announces. Places, everybody. Action. But no one listens to him. Schroeder starts playing his piano, and everyone starts dancing. Nobody cares that Charlie Brown is directing. Nobody cares about the play. They just want to dance. Charlie Brown feels even worse than he did before. This Christmas play is all wrong, he moans. Lucy tries to make him feel better. Everybody knows Christmas is just a time of year for people to buy stuff, she says. But Charlie Brown disagrees. This is one play that is going to be different. We need something to set the proper mood. We need a Christmas tree. Well, every Christmas play should have a Christmas tree, shouldn't it? Ho, 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 ho. That's it, Lucy explains. We need a Christmas tree. A great, big, shiny aluminum tree. You go get the tree, Charlie Brown. I'll take Linus with me, Charlie Brown says. The rest of you can practice your lines. Lucy is excited about the Christmas tree. Get the biggest aluminum tree you can find, she orders. Maybe paint it pink. When Charlie Brown and Linus arrive at the Christmas tree lot, they are surrounded by fake trees. Some are plastic, some are aluminum, some are painted different colors. Some even have polka dots. Linus knocks on one of the aluminum trees. Do they still make wooden Christmas trees, he wonders out loud. Meanwhile, Charlie Brown is starting to feel sad again. None of these trees feel right to him. And there's a picture of them standing in the Christmas tree yard with all the different kinds of Christmas trees, but none of them are real. Then Charlie Brown sees it, a teeny tiny green tree. He smiles. This little tree seems to need a home. Linus hesitates. I don't know, Charlie Brown. This doesn't seem to fit the modern spirit. But Charlie Brown suddenly feels better than he has in days. We'll decorate it, and it will be just right for our play. Besides, I think it needs me. He picks up the tree. Needles tinkle as they fall off the scrawny tree, making, making it even scrawnier. There's Charlie Brown's little Christmas tree, right there. It hasn't got very much on it, but he loves it. Charlie Brown is still smiling when he returns to the auditorium. He gently places the tree down on Schroeder's piano. We're back, he announces. Everyone rushes over to see the tree. They are shocked and disappointed at Charlie's choice. You were supposed to get a good tree, Lucy declares. Can't you even tell a good tree from a poor tree? Everyone agrees. Poor Charlie Brown and his Christmas tree. What happens next is worse of all. Everybody starts to laugh at Charlie Brown and the little tree. Even Snoopy. So even Snoopy's la laughing at Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown feels sadder than ever. He turns to Linus. I guess you were right, he says. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. I really don't know what Christmas is all about. He pauses and looks around. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? To his surprise, it is Linus who answers. Sure, Charlie Brown. 
I can tell you what Christmas is all about. He walks to the center of the stage and says, lights please. Somebody dims the lights in the auditorium and puts a single spotlight on Linus. In a clear voice, Linus begins to speak. There's Linus up on the stage. We're going to hear what he has to say. Shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord came upon them and said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy. For unto, unto you is born this day the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And there was with and there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God, peace on earth, good will to men. Everyone is quiet as Linus finishes. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown, he says. The Linus told him the Christmas story. Charlie Brown picks up his little tree and steps outside. He looks up the, at the dark sky full of twinkling stars. He finally feels happy deep down inside, the way Christmas is supposed to make you feel. Linus is right, he says to himself. I'm not going to let everyone else's greed spoil my Christmas. I'll take this little tree home and decorate it and show everyone it really will work in our play. Charlie Brown passes Snoopy's fully decorated doghouse. Snoopy won first prize. He takes a shiny red ornament off the doghouse and hangs it on the little tree. But the ornament is too heavy and the little tree topples over. Charlie Brown is horrified. I have killed it, he cries. Everything I touch gets ruined. He walks away sadly with his head down, leaving the little tree all alone. Oh, look at the little tree. He put a nice red bulb on there and the tree fell right over. Oh, 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 oh. After Charlie Brown leaves, the others find the tree. I never thought it was such a bad little tree, Lionel says. He wraps his blanket around the tree's face. It's not bad at all, really. All it needs is a little love. Without saying a word, the other kids begin taking the decorations off of Snoopy's doghouse and putting them on the tree. I oh, hope Snoopy's okay with that. It doesn't take long for them to transform the little tree into something magical. So there's Charlie's little tree with all the decorations on it. It's not falling over anymore. When Charlie Brown returns a few minutes later, he can scarcely believe his eyes. First he looks at Snoopy's bare doghouse, then at the beautiful tree. What's going on here, he asks. Then he looks at his friends. Their faces are all shining with joy. Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown, they shout. And before Charlie Brown can say another word, they start to sing Christmas carols. Charlie Brown smiles and starts singing with his friends. He knows it is going to be the best Christmas ever. There you go. They're all singing Christmas carols together. And they're wishing us a Merry Christmas. And that's the end. I hope you enjoyed that. That's a nice book. What are we going to move on to now? I hope everybody's being good out there. I'm so very happy to be here. And I have some fantastic news. As you know, there was talk about no Christmas parade this year. However, things have changed because we're doing so well with COVID and the uh, Ministry of Health has kind of uh, uh, loosened the restrictions. Napanee will be hosting the Napanee Parade of Lights tomorrow night. So we're very, very excited about that. I can't, I just can't believe how incredible that parade is. It's just absolutely stunning. And I hope everybody can join and in the festivities and the lights and all of the other floats. And I hope they have a fantastic time. And I also wish everybody a very Merry Christmas. Ho, 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 ho.